pretend that I have the answers to all anyone's questions. I do not for one moment think that I'm going to settle the debate between theologians that has lasted for 2,000 years over predestination and free will. But I'll share with you my background and my understanding and some scriptures and some thoughts. And if God speaks to you through this presentation, I'll be grateful. I don't even need to know. If you don't agree with me, that's perfectly all right. I, I do not claim to be the final authority on anything. I'd like to start by saying that none of us can fully appropriate what God has for us. He is too far beyond us, above us. Scripture says, who can know the mind of God? 1 Corinthians 2. When I hear someone says, I, I've talked to God and God has talked to me and I know this and everybody better get in line and believe it, I'm already skeptical of that person who has a straight line to heaven and knows more than anyone else. I'm, I do not claim that. The Lord has many attributes. We talk about the characteristics of men and the attributes of God. Uh, I'm not sure I can do this because I can't see, but maybe this this piece up there. Some of the attributes of God. We don't know all the attributes of God because we don't know all about Him. But we'll start with Can you read that? Yes. Easily. He eternal. is eternal. Only God is eternal. Eternal and everlasting are not exactly the same. Everlasting means there's no end. Eternal means there's no beginning or end. Only God is eternal. The cosmos is not eternal. Only God always was, is, and always will be. Amen. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, if that's an attribute of, me, of God, what would be the corresponding characteristics of men? We're temporal. We're just here for a few years at the most. Maybe Sally Dean's 105. I doubt if anyone in this room is going to catch that. <laughs> we, we're all here for... Three score years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for we are soon cut off and we fly away. <laughs> That's one attribute of God. I'll give you another one. He is creator. Well, that means if he's the creator, we're the creatures. <clears throat> Everything that is came to be because of him. He spoke the world, it, world and the cosmos and everything into existence. He spoke it by his word. He says, let there be light. And there was light. There is nothing that exists that he did not create. It's all his. The cattle on a thousand hills. Your life and my life. Your family and my family. Our church and all the churches. They're all in his hands. They're his work not ours. He's creator. Uh, you know the omnis. I'm not going to take the time to write these down, but I'll start it. Omni means all. He's omnipotent. That means he has all power. We have limited power. There are few things that we can do. We have mental powers and emotional powers and physical powers. But God has all power. In fact, the New Testament says more than once, with God all things are possible. There is nothing that he cannot do if he wants to do it. Now this is, under that, we, we think about his sovereignty. The sovereignty of God means that he is at the apex of all. If everything that ever was or ever will be is here, he is here. God is above it all. 
He is ruler, master, king of kings, lord of lords. He is the preeminent one. He takes precedence over every other one. He is the only God, the only true and living God. That's why we have the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He's the only one. The others are nothing. Well, there's omnipotent. I'll give you a little. Potent means power. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. Omni plus science means he's um, he knows everything. There is nothing that he does not know. He knows everything there is to know about everything and everyone. Uh, are you confident of that? Yes. Amen. Amen. Okay. It's important because we're going to come back to it. There is nothing that is hidden from him. Nothing is hidden from him with whom we have to do. That's right out of the book. I know you know that. He's omniscient. He is also omnipresent. That means he is everywhere. 139th Psalm says, If I ascend into the heavens, behold, thou art there. If I descend into the lower parts of the earth, behold, thou art there. There is nowhere that God can be eliminated. He is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. Uh, you can also use the word infinite. That's an important word from where we're going to go. I'm, by the way, I'm not off my topic, topic Bill. I'm trying to set up for Fine, it. fine. <laughs> Being infinite, that means there is no limitation to God. Now, some people think space is infinite. That's not true. Now, I studied enough algebra and geometry to know, to know what that is. And I know what they try to say. But there is nothing and no one who deserves the word infinite except God. Because he's beyond us, transcendent, above us, beyond mm -hmm. us. He's sovereign. He is God. Nail that down if you don't get anything else I get out of it today. Well, there are other attributes of God, but I think for our, we say God is love, <laughs> God is light, and so on. But we'll, this is setting it up for where, what we're going to get to here in a little bit, whether you think we are or not. <laughs> now, you have two opposites here. <coughs> We have people in the church for 2,000 years who have majored on the sovereignty of God. And they are right to do that. <clears throat> he is sovereign. He is first, foremost, preeminent. But there are others in the church for 2,000 years who have majored on the free will of man. Now there are the two opposites that you could put on one side. Sovereignty of God free will of man. Now I want to introduce you to, and I know you know this word, but in this context, I want you to see this word. Paradox. Now paradox is not two physicians. <laughs> Thank you. Bad old. <laughs> Thursday, somebody's going to get that and call me and say, I heard that. <laughs> A paradox is best to me. Let me draw you another. I like to write on the board. They always said when the teacher doesn't know what to do, he writes on the board. <laughs> I'm not by any means a great artist, but I'm going to draw a little bit here. Good. Every one of you, I guess, I certainly have, has stood in the middle of a railroad track and looked down the road, and the track is exactly the same distance apart, one on the left, one on the right, at every point, 
no matter how far you look. Right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now here are two parallel tracks. Para, by the way, I meant to tell you, paradox comes from two Greek words. Para meaning alongside, and dakeo, which means to think. And it means to think two things that are parallel to each other that seem to be contradictory. Now the Eastern mind can carry two, two, two thoughts in the mind at the same time. We Westerners have a little bit of a problem with that. But in the Bible, very important, in the Bible, you can find scripture after scripture that emphasizes, teach and emphasize the sovereignty of God. In the scriptures, you can find plenty of scriptures that emphasize the free will of man to respond. Now you better get a paradox in your mind because you're going to have to learn to use. You got, I don't care how far you go, 100, 100 feet down the railroad track, a hundred yards, a hundred miles, from here to the end of wherever it's going, New York, Boston, wherever. That track is still the same, the two tracks are still that far apart. But the farther you go, the more it seems they come together. Now, let me give you another. I just wrote those Greek words on there so you know I've been to school. <laughs> <laughs> Let me draw another, another line. I want that line to represent the limit of man's understanding. Do you admit that man has a limit to his understanding? Oh, yeah. Amen. Okay. We'll, we'll call this uh, the limit, the cloud. This is all cloud. If you can, I, I don't have chalk to put in, but everything above this line is cloudy because man can't get above that. Everything above that is God's infinity. We could call this finitude or limited understanding or this infinity, God's limitless mind, power, sovereignty, his attributes. That's why I went into that a while ago. Okay, now here is a, a house. And here is a roof. And that roof might represent the sovereignty. The sovereignty of God. And we can understand that just as far as God gives us understanding mm -hmm. to know Him. Mm -hmm. No one can know Him completely. <clears throat> no one can see His face and live. He is God. He is spirit. <coughs> when, when God made man in his own likeness, it didn't mean that God made man to look like God because mm -hmm. God, God is not a man. God is not a human being. It meant he was in God's spiritual likeness and had spiritual fellowship with God. He walked in the garden with God, communicated with God. I'll get back to that in a minute. But over here, we've got the limit of human understanding, the cloud above that. Now, here, here's the free will of man taught in the Bible. We'll go through some of those verses. I'll just put free will. That's good enough for the moment, because I'm going to erase that in a minute anyway. We... We have a lot of people for 2,000 years who have stood on this side of the building and the roof and looked at it and said, I am believe in the sovereignty of God. And they, they are right. The Bible teaches that. There are people over here who say, I believe in the free choice of man, man's freedom to choose whether he will or will not. Well, that's true. You and I both know scriptures that all teach this. And we'll go through some of them if you want to. We don't see how they come together. 
But in the, in the mind of God, that roof comes together. And when we see him, then we'll know. It says, now I know in part. Then we shall know as we are also known. Well, now we look through a mirror or glass darkly, but then face to face. So some of the questions that we cannot, we cannot get beyond this limit of human understanding. We can't, we can't see how they can be together and be true, but they are. They're both true. I believe in the full sovereignty of God. And I believe in the free, free choice of man because they're both taught in the scriptures. We can, talk, we can talk about that a little bit, and we will. And we're going to try to come to some little understanding about how they work together. When God made man in his own image, he made him to be a tripartite individual. Trichotomous is the word theologians use. That means man had a body. I'm talking about Adam now. Body. He had a body. He had a soul. And he had a spirit. And this is the part of man that can know God. <clears throat> and communicate with God. <clears throat> to whom God reveals himself. When Adam who had a free choice. He, the Lord told Adam, you can eat of any tree in this garden. And by that he meant you can eat, eat any herb, any vegetable, any fruit. It's all here for you. you. You can eat whatever, birds or fish or animals you want. It's all here and it's all pure and perfect. There was nothing to defile the Garden of Eden. One restriction. He says, there's a tree in the middle of the garden, tree of knowledge of good and evil. You can't eat from that. Because if you do, you're going to die. Now, did he mean he was going to kill him? No. He didn't mean he was going to die physically. He meant he was going to die spiritually. And so from Adam on, man has been a two-partite person. Tr dichotomous. Body. And soul, but not spirit. And the way Ephesians 2 describes that, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, this part having been eliminated at the fall, and in, as in Ad, through Adam one man's sin, sin entered into the world, and so death by sin, Paul writes. When Adam sinned, he and Eve, they were put out of the garden, and died spiritually that day. And ever since then, people coming into the world have both been born with something missing. People without Christ are dead in trespasses and sins. Got that nailed down? Mm -hmm. If you don't have it nailed down, you need to nail that down. But I gave you Ephesians 2, 1. Go down five verses. But he says, you who were dead in trespassing and sins have been made alive in Christ Jesus. So when we get saved, we get a new heart and a new life, and we're born again into the family of God spiritually. We are born into the family of God and baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. That's the only baptism that's essential for salvation, by the way. The Amen. baptism of the Spirit. Yep. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we've all been baptized by one Spirit into one body. Nail that down if you don't have it nailed down. Okay. Now, how does this all work? I say that when we started talking about the attributes of God, that one of the attributes of God was His sovereignty. I think I spell that correctly. Can you read it? Yes. Um, the will of God. The sovereign will of God will not be thwarted. I want you to repeat that after me. The sovereign, sovereign will, will of God, God 
will not be thwarted. What he declares is going to be, is going to be. No question about that. Now, there's nobody in this world now or ever has been since Eve, Adam and Eve before the fall who understood that very well. We just understand so much of it. We're limited with human understanding. But he is in charge. He is God. His sovereign will will be completed. Now, there are two kinds of people in the churches. Some of them some of them believe in fatalism. Sometimes they call it predestination. Not the same. Uh, there are others who just don't believe in any of that. Uh, if you can remember, we're talking now about the sovereignty of God. I want you to see that over here, the will of God. Now, there are a number of ways to look at the will of God in the scriptures. You know, my knees are giving out on. <clears throat> there are many ways to look at the will of God in the scriptures. First of all, we've talked about the ultimate will of God that, that absolutely will be accomplished. But there's another will of God, and that is the that is the permissive will of God. Say that. Permissive, Permissive will, will of God. God. That's what God allows to happen even though it's not his perfect will. You say, now that doesn't make sense. Yes, it does. Now you think. All the way back before there was man in the garden, there was a, an angel in heaven. And his name was Lucifer. And he was an archangel like Michael and Gabriel. You can read this in, in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 34, 38. Uh, he, he was an archangel, stood at the throne of God. And then he decided one day that he didn't want to be subservient to God. He wanted to be God. God gave him the choice. He could serve the true and living God, or he could rebel and get kicked out of heaven. Guess what he did? He made the wrong choice. But God gave it to him. And he was sent out of heaven. He is known today and through the scriptures and with many, many names. He was Lucifer there, but he's also called Satan. That old serpent, the devil. A roaring lion. The adversary. The accuser. He's got 15 or 20 names in the scriptures. You know who he is. He is the prince of evil. He's the prince of this world. God has given him, by God's permissive will, the moment of ruling in this world. Is there anybody in this room who would dispute that? He is ru ru ruling this world. But it's only for a time. And the time is coming when God is going to take this thing back. And what he created out of nothing, he's going to destroy into nothing. 1 Peter 3.10 says the elements will melt with fervent heat. There's the atomic principle in the word of God. That's how God is going to destroy the world. You read it. I, I can read it to you. Take the rest of the time to do that. God, when God is through with time and space and matter and mankind and everything, so on, when he gets through with all that, he's going to bring it to pass. It's all gone in a big ball of fire, a huge atomic hydrogen explosion. That's how God's going to destroy the world. It's written for you in 1 Peter 3.10. Well, is that the end? No. Listen at Revelation 21. I saw a, a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first heaven were all, first earth and first heaven were all passed away, and there was no more sea. I, John, saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
Well, praise God be to that. Amen? Amen. Amen. So where were we up here? We were talking about the will of God. The will of God is His perfect, sovereign, directive will of God that will not be thwarted. But God has chosen to limit His own will at the point of our will. It's seen with Lucifer. It's seen with Adam in the garden. And it's seen with every person in the world since, including you and me. He didn't knock you down and tell you you had to come to church this morning. He didn't knock you down when you met Jesus Christ and tell you you had to be saved and you didn't have anything to do with it. You got time. You don't know how much I've got. <laughs> it don't matter. <laughs> you had a choice. And it's seen all the way through the Bible from Lucifer to Adam to every man, David, Solomon, you name them. And then you come to the New Testament and Jesus. Excuse me, I have a, a runny nose. And my family have, has a way of telling me you may not feel it, or you may not see it, but you need to wipe your nose. <laughs> I also get it on my tie and everything. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to use it again in a minute. Thank you. <clears throat> when you come to the New Testament, you hear Jesus. And Jesus says, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Well, now that surely has the opposite of it. The one who doesn't come to me, what's he going to do with him? You can answer me. Cast him out. He said, him that cometh to me, I will not cast out. Well, you know the answer. Okay, take the rich young ruler. Knees giving out again. The rich young ruler. He came to Jesus one day. He had everything that people in our day and every day look for. Riches, youth, power, Everything. Clothes. I guess if it were in this day, he'd be driving a, a what's that big Chevrolet they build down in Bowling Green? Corvette. Corvette. Yeah, he'd be driving a big Corvette. He's got everything. But he knows there's something missing in his life. It's that center that's dead in trespasses and sin. So he said to Jesus, what good thing can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Mm. <laughs> hey, you could spend a month on that one. Mm. Mm. He meant by that, of course, do you realize that you're talking to God in the flesh? But the rich young ruler didn't. He, didn't, he couldn't get up to that level of understanding. By the way, the level of our understanding raises when we're born again and the Spirit of God comes into our minds and hearts and he leads us into all truth. You with me, brothers? Amen. All right. So he said, well, if you want to know how to do it on your own, just keep the commandments. He said, all these I've kept from my youth up. And Jesus, well, if you think you're perfect, try this one on. Go and sell all you have and give it to the poor. And then come follow me. And the scriptures record he went away sorrowful. For he had much possessions. Now he had the opportunity to make his life complete. He stood before the prince of life and could have said yes. But he chose to say no. So here we have it. We have the sovereignty of God, the will of God that will not be thwarted. And he knows what's going to happen. And it's going to be. But he has chosen to limit his own will at the point of our will. Your will and my will. He's not through with us. He's going to work in us. He's going to work with us. And what he works in us, he's going to complete to that day. That's part of predestination, Bill. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. On one side of the people, on one side, the people who, who believe in what is to be, will be. You've heard that all your life, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, if you haven't, you've heard it now, and I want you to hear it again. <laughs> there are people who believe what is to be will be, and you don't have anything to do with it, and neither does God, and neither does anybody else. There are those who believe that in the church. Now, in, in the 16th century, in the 1500s, there came into, the, into history some important people. Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses on the castle door at Wittenberg, started the Protestant Reformation. In that same century, Jacob Arminius came into the Dutch Reformed group. I want to give you these two words because they might be confusing to you. I forget where I, I can't see because if I, I can't see that, see, so I, I forget where I'm writing, so I start over. <laughs> I'll leave off that in. This Jacob Arminius is spelled with an I. A-R-M-I-N-U-S. He, he, he was in the Dutch Reformed Church, born in 1560, died in 1607. And John Wesley and all the people who have believed in, in the Methodist tradition, the Wesley tradition, all them, they're good people. I'm not putting them down. I'm having a hot flash, y'all. Excuse, excuse me. <laughs> don't laugh, it's true. I know. Uh, no, you don't know, but I'll tell you. I've had <laughs> prostate cancer for 16 years, <clears throat> and recently I've been having some bleeding in the urine, so I went to my urologist, and I said, what do you want to do about it? He said, well, I don't think you need any x-rays, or I don't think you need any surgery at your age, and We've been messing with this thing 15 years. I think we can work it out. I said, what about the belief? He said, I'll give you a female hormone. And I said, uh, now what are go what, what, what's all that going to do to me? He says, well, for one thing, you'll have hot flashes. <laughs> <laughs> and I can, see these, I can see these women who get to be about 40 years ago sitting in the church doing this. <laughs> Now I'm doing it. <laughs> See, give me a shot. But I don't want to get too far off on that. I want to go back here. <laughs> Jacob Arminius, spelled A R M I N I U S, he started this business of saying, he championed the free will of man to the extent that he forgot the sovereignty of God. Did I say that well enough? Did you understand that? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, if you, if you go to see it on either side of the, you remember this mountain that I built a while ago? If you go to see it on either side and forget the other, you're leaving out a part of the scriptures because they're both taught right there, paradoxically, in the scripture. Well, Arminius led the group that became known as Arminians. But there is a country over there, spelled A-R-M-E-N-I-A, and that an Armenian from the country is not the same as an Armenian that followed Jacob Arminius. I'm telling you that only because some of you have asked the question, what's the difference? Well, on the other side of the Armenians, I-A-N-S, Armenians. On the other side of the Calvinists, He's that third person I told you came along in the 16th century. Martin Luther, Jacob Arminius, and John Calvin. And John Calvin was the one who started the Reformed Church. And in, in America, it's mostly Presbyterian and the Reformed Church of America and some others. There are Baptists like that. Have you ever heard of hard shells? Mm -hmm. Have you ever known some primitive Baptists? Well, they, these are people who believe 
They're good people. I love them. I've had them in my churches, not baptized members, but they've come and hear the word preach. I love them as brothers and sisters. They got some warped ideas about the Sabbath. They got some other warped ideas about not having a Sunday school class. But but they're good people. But they believe what is to be will be. And there's nothing you and I can do about it. It's in God's hand. Now the atheists are the ones who say what is to be will be, and there is no God. There's a difference. Mm. So the people who follow in the Christian tradition and Primitive Baptists, Hardshell Baptists, and a good many Southern Baptists. Did you know there's a large Calvinist group at Southern Seminary? Did mm. you know that? No. no. Well, I'm here to tell you. Uh, the president is a wonderful person, Albert Moeller, a personal friend of mine. He's, he's a deeply committed Christian. He's a, a brilliant man with several degrees, and I love him, but he's kind of gone to seed on Calvinism. And Calvinism magnifies the sovereignty of God to the exclusion of the free will of man. I hope now you're beginning to see why I set this up and the way I did at the beginning. Now if you don't know what Calvinism is, I'll tell you what The five points of Calvinism are identified by the word tulip. And you may have heard these before, but I'll explain them to you just a little bit. Am I going over something that you don't want to hear about? No, sir. No. All right. Okay. T stands for total depravity. Now, I believe in total depravity in this sense. That means that man is by no means able at any way to save himself. So he's totally <laughs> depraved. Got that? Got it. I can accept that. Now the super Calvinists go a little farther than that. But just for the moment, I'm going to say I, I agree with them on total depravity. The U stands for unconditional election. They believe that Somewhere back in eternity, God saw how many people there would be, and he elected these to be saved and these to be lost, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. Unconditional election. I do not believe that. L stands for limited atonement. I don't accept this either because that teaches that Christ died only for the redeemed, only for the saved. But the New Testament says again and again, Christ died for us sinners, and not for us only, but for also for the sins of the whole world. Yeah, you know that verse. I don't have to quote it for you. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay, that's pretty important, isn't it? Yes. Total depravity, I accept that. Unconditional atonement, I don't accept that. Uh, unconditional election. Limited atonement, no. I think he died for the sins of the whole world. It's only given to those who receive it by faith. Okay? Okay. I, irresistible grace. And that means when God puts his spotlight on a man and tells him he's going to be saved, there's nothing he can do about it. God's going to put that grace in his life regardless. Well now if God wanted to do that, God could do that. And if he does want to do it, he will do it and nothing we can do about it. But I don't see that in the scriptures <coughs> that God invades a person's mm -hmm. will against his will to make him do what is right. You don't see that in your life and you don't see that in the lives of your children. God gives us a choice. He give, he, we have four sons, as you know. I don't know each of you and your family how many children you have or don't have. But I'll guarantee you this. Every child you had had a mind of his or her own. Amen. 
Yes, indeed. I went to my great grandson's party yesterday. He was one years old. My great grandson, mm. Levi Sisk. Mm. <laughs> anyway, we got up there, and there, there were several little children there about that same age. One little girl that was born four days after Levi. Well, Levi is <coughs> pulling up and standing at the table and beating on it and doing up. And he could walk if he knew it, but he doesn't know it, so he doesn't yet walk. But there's a little girl there, four days younger than he. She walked all over that house like she owned it. <laughs> and there were three of these little kids playing with something that they found interesting. She walked right over there and took hold of everything. She took charge. <laughs> Can't you know what she's going to be when she gets married? <laughs> a man says he's boss and home will lie about other things. <laughs> Irresistible grace. When God sets his light on you and tells you you're going to be saved, there's nothing you can do about it. He's going to put his grace in you. I don't see that in the Bible. P, perseverance of the saints. Mm. Well, I believe that. They believe it a little stronger than I do, and they express it in a little different way from what I... I believe that. I believe that what God began this good work in us, He will perform it to that day. I believe a person who is born of God can never be lost. Amen. He can be wayward and childish and foolish and other things. He can wander away. He can get out of fellowship with God, but he can't get out of relationship to God because he's been born into the family of God and given eternal life and will never perish. Amen. See, Jesus said that, John 10. He says, I give unto them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will pluck them out of my Father's hand and no one will pluck them out of my hand. Well, we're safe and secure. Now, that's not the same as to say you can be saved and then live as you please. I don't believe that. I believe you can be saved and learn to live as he pleases. I believe that you're saved to the uttermost and saved forever. I believe, that, I believe in the perseverance of saints. Now, we all know, excuse me, these legs are gone again. We all know there are people who have started out with us. Perhaps the person has been a Sunday school teacher, maybe a deacon, maybe a preacher, maybe an evangelist. Well, you can just add whatever you want to. And then all of a sudden that person says, I no longer believe, I, I, I reject my former stance, I turn, I don't believe in God, I'm, just, I'm going my own way. You say, well, that person had it and lost it. No, that person never had it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. <clears throat> Listen to a verse from 1 John chapter 2. This, I, I'm an English major, and I love language. I love the parts of speech. I'm going to talk to you about a preposition now. You listen for the prepositions in this simple little verse. There were some people in John's experience who had done just what I've described. So he wrote, and I quote, They went out from us because they were not of us. Mm -hmm. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. Mm -hmm. Did you get that from and with and out? That's rich, friends. Uh, I, I don't believe a person who is born of God can ever be lost. He might become rebellious, and God may have to chastise him, and may have to move the candle out of the candlestick, but he, he will not be lost. He may lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. God may have a lot of things in store for him, but a person who is born of God can never be lost. Now, there are people in Baptist churches who do not believe that. Does that surprise you? No. Nope. It shouldn't. Right. And there are a lot of people in the Methodist church who believe that because that's part of Arminianism, Wesleyanism, and so on. They, they believe in Christ and they understand the gospel, and, but, but they, they missed it here. I do, that doesn't mean I sit in judgment on their eternity. No, I don't, 
I don't judge any person's heart because I can't see another person's heart. Neither can you. But I can be a fruit inspector. <laughs> <laughs> You'll know them by the fruit they bear. You're right. So you've got the five points of Calvinism. On the other side is Arminianism. And they believe that a person can be saved and lost. And they believe that a person can just stand and defy God and do whatever he wants to and 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 there's there's no ultimate day of reckoning but friends there is a day of reckoning coming amen so now we've got the problem huh? I've just about got time to wind it up and I haven't come to where you wanted me to start but you can't start <laughs> you can't start down the road you have to start where you are you may have to come back <laughs> Here's this this house top again, and the cloud of human understanding. Why don't you ask him to continue next Sovereignty week? of God, free will of man. How do they come together? Now I'm going to give you two scriptures. You've been in here a whole hour and haven't even opened your Bible, have you? Open your Bible to Romans chapter 8. We're coming up on that in our study. That's good. You look at it again. <laughs> we haven't gotten there yet. You'll remember it when you come back. <laughs> and when you get to Romans 8, turn it over to 1 Peter 2. Have you found Romans 8? Yes, sir. Look at verse 29. Everybody in here knows 28, for whom he did. Uh, that's, all things work together for good to them who love God. It should be translated, God works together all things for those who love him. Now, verse 29, it says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. I'm quoting the King James Version because that's the one I memorized at Moody Bible Institute in 1945. It's been a long time. That's what it says in the New International Version too. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Now look at me. You agreed with me that God has omniscience, all knowledge, that he knows everything there is to know about everyone and everything, right? Yes. Right. Don't be timid with me. <laughs> you agree with me that God has all knowledge. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. He has always known it because there's no change with God. God is immutable. The same yesterday, today, and forever. God <laughs> knew before the foundation of the world what you would do with Christ. He knew that. That doesn't take your free will away from you. You have the right to choose yes or no. But he knew what you would do. And based on his foreknowledge, he ordained it. So predestination is no problem for me. He predestined me to be saved because he knew when I was given an opportunity to receive Christ, I'd say yes in repentance and faith and be saved. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Now turn to 1 Peter 2, uh, 1, 1 Peter 1, 2. I've got the wrong number up here. 1 Peter 1, 2. Maybe it's 2, 1. I believe it's 2, 1. 1, 2. Huh? It's one, two. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Is that what it says? Yes. One, two. Okay. Sometimes I get my numbers mixed up. But you see, I didn't make notes for this thing because I couldn't see my notes. Now we are the elect, the called out ones, the saved ones, the predestined ones. Predestination and election mean essentially the same in these two passages. And how did he know to elect us? Because he knew ahead of time what we were going to do. 
based on his foreknowledge, he elected us. Now that to me, I don't know about to you, but to me, with understanding from the Holy Scriptures and I trust from the Holy Spirit, these two come together and make one roof. Well, I'm tired and I'm done. Thank you. Are you sure you're done? You wouldn't want to come back next week and continue? <laughs> no, sir. I, I'll tell you the honest truth. I've been working on it, whether you realize it or not. I've been working on this for several weeks. I don't know that. But I do it without a computer or without a Bible or without a notepad because I can't see. But I thank you for listening to me. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.